All right, let's kick into costume. And let's do an anatomy of costume in the Quattrocento. And it looked something like this, and was basically confined to the Italian city-states. Here are a couple of images that I think give you an idea of the kind of silhouette we're looking at. It is completely different to what we saw in the 1400s elsewhere in Europe, isn't it? No hoopalans. Let's break it down. Let's do an anatomy. It started off with a camicia. A camicia. This was a simple long-sleeved linen smock. Now you'll see a lot of the words we're going to be using in this lecture are Italian, not French. Why? France lost its uh, crown when it came to fashion, didn't it? The focus shifted to Italy, and so we are going to be talking Italian in this lecture, at least for the first part of it, the camicia. A long-sleeved smock dress. Over that went the gamura. Gamura. This was a high-waisted dress, often with detachable sleeves. But listen, guys, we cannot say en pierre at this point. We cannot say en pierre until the early 1900s, when we can talk about Napoleon's empire and the return of en pierre, or the invention of en pierre. So don't call this an en pierre waistline. It's a gamura, and it's understood that a gamura has a high waist. Over the gamura went the giornia. Reminding you here not to call it en pierre waist. It was a dress that was split at the sides, then belted just below the bosom. And that's what it looked like when it all came together. And here's a slightly clearer image. Look at the sleeves. They are often divided into two, the upper sleeve and the fore sleeve, and then they are tied at the middle. It's a very interesting silhouette, isn't it? I absolutely love it. I think it's so pretty and so flattering. This gives you uh, an image of what all this looked like from the side. And you can see the giornia is split down the side, so it reveals the dress beneath. And as the Quattrocento progressed, you'll find that the skirts got a little fuller. Everything got a tiny bit fuller. And this is what they look like from the back. Let's look at guys. Here is a painting. And then if you look at the guy on the right, you see that this is a pretty accurate reconstruction of what men wore, fashionable men, in the Quattrocento. Let's break it down. They wore a doublet. Remember, we met the doublet when we did the late Middle Ages. Often padded with a leg of mutton sleeve. Hose, sometimes me party. A cod piece or a braguette. Yep, we're, we're looking at the cod piece again. And this, it's really a husk, isn't it? We looked at the husk, remember, when we did the late Middle Ages. But this too is called a giornia because it works exactly the same way as the female giornia works. You just uh, fold it over and there it is. But male giornios were often quilted with organ pipe folds. We'll discuss those later. And belted at the waist. So you see, it's a very slender silhouette, although the guy on the right here isn't too slender himself, and very colourful. It's also rather feminine. Over all of this came your chioppa. This was a cape, basically, and again, it was often padded and split. But I would like you to note that the lining is a different colour. This often happened in the Quattrocento. You'll see linings being different colors to, to the main uh, fabric of the garment to give dynamism, to give color. We saw a little bit happening with Mi Parti and the Hoopalands, didn't we? But this really was a feature. And I'd also like you to note that a lot of clothing in the Quattrocento was trimmed in black. So it was a very dynamic palette, which we'll look at 
and focus on a little bit later. And what were people wearing on their feet? Well, men were wearing little booties, but ladies were wearing high heels. Look at these. These are called chopines, and they're basically platform heels, platform heel wedges. A lot of people think that high heels started in the reign of Marie Antoinette or something, but they didn't. In the West, they started in the 1400s, although people had been wearing high heels in Asia for far longer. Let's look at hair and headdresses in the Quattrocento. We have a wonderful profile image here that really breaks down what was happening. This whole hairstyle is called a coazzoni. It's really fun saying Italian words, coazzoni. I think I'm saying everything right. I speak French. I don't speak Italian. I'm really good when there's any French words. Um, but I only did a one semester of Italian in college. And so, fingers crossed, I'm getting everything right. You can tell me if you speak Italian and I'm saying something wrong. But the uh, quattoni was this whole rigmarole that was going on here. Hair was centre parted and smoothed to the head with a long, probably false braid at the back often incorporating ribbons or netting. Hair was smoothed down and some kind of product, probably olive oil, was used to keep it very smooth, very flat and very shiny. Then we have the Trinzalli. This was a sheer sort of hairnet headdress worn at the very back of the head. Sometimes it was beaded, sometimes it had gold thread in it, or sometimes it was simple. Then the Lenza. This was a leather cord worn around the head, sometimes bejeweled, probably served the function of keeping the hair flat and keeping the trinzali in place. There were no hairpins yet. The metal hairpin would be invented in the mid-1500s, so ladies didn't have long to wait. But for now, um, no hairpins. So the lenser was probably used to keep all of this stuff in place. And I wanted to show you this. This is a fashion layout from Vogue. And you can see it's completely inspired by the Guazzoni and the whole art and look and palette of the Quattrocento, which is why you have to know this stuff. Another rather strange thing women did with their hair was this. It was called hair taping. They would use long strips of ribbon to secure their hair, to tape it into the most extraordinary shapes, like this one. And this one, and she has another element added. Often, pieces of very sheer cloth were interwoven into the hair. This one is covering her ears, and it has a name. These pieces of uh, cloth were called bendas. And here you see hair taping being used quite extraordinarily. Look at all of these curls and these braids. And it's all so complicated. She has to tie it under her chin. Presumably, a lot of this hair was false. We've seen, we've been in love with wigs and hair pieces forever, haven't we? And if they were using fake braids in the 1200s, we can bet they were using them in the 1400s too. And here is another wonderful image of this hairstyle. A lot going on there. But I really want you to note the palette as well. I think you're really starting to get a feel on this wonderful, rich, strange, kind of dusty palette of the Quattrocento. And here is, I think, a very Quattrocento-inspired hairdo from today's runway. What do you think? Completely Italian Renaissance. Guy's hair. Okay, this was strange. In the Quattrocento, men wore page boy hairdos like this, which they would curl under with curling tongs. A very odd look. Or they would let their hair be a little bit more natural, but I tell you, underneath that cap, I bet he has bangs. So men's hair was long, it was shoulder length in the Quattrocento in Italy. 
the headdress, and it would change shape when we get into the 1500s, but called the same name. This is the preferred hat for ladies. It is called a balzo, a balzo, and this is how it was constructed. It was made out of balsa wood or wicker, this kind of basket we frame over which you would place cloth, a balzo. So, rebirthing the Renaissance, let's take a look at Quattrocento influence on fashion and styling and beauty and everything today. Just to remind you of what a Quattrocento dress looks like structurally, see what's going on there, all of those layers and that high waist, etc, etc. Let's take a look at some runway that I really think is inspired by the Quattrocento. Would you agree? Especially this last one here. And when I was doing research, I stumbled upon this male model who's terribly handsome, but I think he looks so Quattrocento. All you have to do is put on a cap and a doublet and hello. I really think he has the ideal, the ideal uh, look of the Quattrocento. His face that you see on the right appears in so many Italian Renaissance paintings. But sticking with the guys, check this out. Wow, that's pretty Quattrocento, isn't it? That's John Galliano. Menswear. Runway. Yeah, a guy is really going to wear that. But still, inspired by the Quattrocento. You may have noticed that there was a decorative detail on a lot of these garments. This was a little craze that started in the 1400s but would continue all the way through the 1500s called Slash and Puff. Look at her sleeve. Basically, the outer garment is slashed, has little cuts in it, and then the inner garment, the smock or the chemise or the shirt, would be pulled through, puffed out like that. Slash and puff. Here is another example of slash and puff. This is Henry VIII with slash and puff. Of course, he comes from the 1500s. You can see this was around for a long time. And that's uh, uh, an actual sleeve with uh, slash and puff so you can see the way it functions and you can see the way it works and it also explains why undergarments these simple smocks or shirts or chemises were so billowy and voluminous you needed a lot of fabric if you were going to puff it through the slashes right and here are a few things that i think are inspired by slash and puff Remember I talked to you about these padded folds? They have a name. They are called organ pipe folds. And here we have a piece of art from the Quattrocento, which demonstrates very nicely. Also, look at the brocade on this uh, outfit and look at the brocade on the theatrical costume here on the left. Brocade was very, very big in the Renaissance, both in the Southern Renaissance and the Northern Renaissance brocade. I want to briefly throw a spotlight onto the Quattrocento palette because the use of color and the color combinations were so completely unique and so instantly recognizable. Just to give you a visual read, here is some Quattrocento art. Take a look at that palette. All of those reds, those sort of dark crimson reds, a lot of gold, but also a lot of earth tones, a lot of clay tones, um, touches of blue. It was really a very, very unique palette. And when you see it all together, these color combinations are extraordinary. And they lend themselves rather nicely to contemporary fashion. Here are some runway looks that draw from the Quattrocento palette with those sage greens and those deep crimsons. But all of it sort of dusty looking, very particular. But here's the thing. When you're writing about fashion or talking about fashion, 
use the vocabulary that you've picked up in fashion history and global attire if you're a descri if you are describing a collection that has nothing to do with the Italian Renaissance but uses this palette you could write about it and use the word quattrocento you know even if it was if, even if it's a very space age futuristic collection you could say the space age forms were offset nicely with a quattrocento palette so use these these words it really uh, uh, adds to your fashion vocabulary in general and by the way don't you just love that dress on the right with the coral I love that dress in fact the silhouette is rather quattrocento all right let's move into the 1500s Italy is peaking it's at its absolute height but Spain and Portugal are expanding and northern Europe is about to boil over you had to go big or go home and this includes fashion so let's do an anatomy of 16th century Italo-Spanish costume costume from Italy and Spain because they were the dominant cultures and of course when we talk about Italian uh, fashion art and culture in this century we talk about the Cinquecento, right, the Cinquecento, but I find that rather difficult to say, so I'm just going to call it the 1500s. Well, hopefully you can see immediately that the silhouette has changed. It's become quite enormous. The world had doubled in size. In 1492, the world had doubled in size. And fashion responded fashion got big you had to work even harder to show your importance to show your wealth to show your status everything got big and here are some images that show you how big everything got for men and for women with huge sleeves big skirts an awful lot of billowing satin let's break it down basically we're really working with the same layered idea here you started with your smock and then we meet something new that we'll look at in further depth in a bit not exactly a corset it's something called a busk it was made out of whalebone and it didn't pull you in at the waist as corsets in the uh, later centuries would do it sort of flattened you out and stiffened your torso to give you a very firm scaffold on which to hold all of this heavy fabric over that went your sleeveless gown with detachable sleeves and then you'll see this is the bolt so again but it's taken on a very different shape instead of being sort of conical at the back of the head like in the quattrocento now it's like a big donut but these detachable sleeves with all of this ruching at the top well they have a name they are called baragoni baragoni sleeves so they're large decorative puffs at the top of sleeves sometimes they would be attached to the top of the dress sometimes they would be uh, attached to the top of the sleeve why were sleeves detachable well it kind of makes sense sleeves get dirty very easily don't they um, they get into your food you get ink on them etc sleeves get dirty it was a big deal to launder one of these gowns right so it was easier to have a bunch of sleeves you could replace uh, every day or every couple of days without having to launder the whole dress so this is why sleeves were detachable fashion is not an island it's a response and sometimes it's a response to messy eating here you see the baragoni on a male doublet here is the colletto this was a sheer piece of fabric sometimes lace sometimes it had pearls on it or beads that was either pinned into the neckline of the gamura the dress um, which was a bit later or at the beginning 
of the uh, 15th century, it was pushed into the neckline, a bit like a shawl, like this. Do you see what I mean? And here is another coletto, and this one has a lattice lace work with pearls. Very pretty. This gives you an idea of what these dresses look like from the side. And you can see that there is an emphasis on the butt. This would change. There is no undergarment. The farthingale hadn't started quite yet in Italy. We'll look at the farthingale in a second. But I want you to get an idea of the lower part of a woman's body starting to take on strange shapes. Because it would continue to take on strange shapes for the next 500 years. Some of them really strange. And for boys, we are getting a new piece of attire in the 1500s, the jerkin. The jerkin was a close-fitting short sleeve jacket worn over the doublet, although sometimes it could be worn directly over the chemise for more casual wear or for sport. And here are two surviving jerkins. These have actually survived. The one on the um, right is made of leather, a light colored leather, which was very popular for jerkins. And here are hose and doublets with jerkins today, or at least the look of doublets and uh, jerkins and hose on ladies. The Spanish court had a very different flavour. It was still big, but less voluminous and, I think, much more dramatic. Let's look at Spanish court fashion. An awful lot of black velvet, black satin, and a lot of gold, black and gold together. This really marked Spanish court fashion. It gave the court, its fashion flavor. And here is a surviving dress. This one comes from the very early 1600s, actually. But you get the idea. The black would be far blacker 500 years ago. But you can see all of that gold brocade and gold embroidery. So this black and gold look completely marked the Spanish court. And here is some recent runway that I think is completely inspired by Spanish court fashion in the 1500s. Do you agree? Look at all that gold filigree.